Greetings and welcome to LSI Industries Fiscal Second Quarter 2021 Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to introduce your host, Jim Galise, Chief Financial Officer. Thank you. You may begin. Good morning, everyone. We issued a press release before the market opened this morning detailing our fiscal second quarter results. In conjunction with this release, we also posted a conference call presentation in the investor relations portion of our corporate website at www.lsicorp.com. Information contained in this presentation will be referenced throughout today's conference call. Included are certain non-GAAP measures for improved transparency of our operating results. A complete reconciliation of second quarter GAAP and non-GAAP results is contained in our press release and 10Q. I would like to remind you that management's commentary and responses to questions on today's conference call may include forward-looking statements about our business outlook. Such statements involve risks and opportunities and actual results could differ materially. I refer you to our safe harbor statement, which appears in this morning's press release, as well as our most recent 10K and 10Q. Today's call will begin with remarks summarizing our fiscal second quarter results. At the conclusion of these prepared remarks, we will open the line for questions. With that, I'll turn the call over to LSI President and Chief Executive Officer Jim Clark. Good morning, all, and Happy New Year. Thank you for joining today's call. In 2019, we sat down as a team to transform our company with the purpose of developing and refining our focus in creating a growth-oriented, competitive, and defensible position in the marketplace. The underpinning of our strategy has been around the development of vertical markets where we can better serve and understand the needs of our customers with the goal of adding value to differentiate ourselves from our competitors and general market commoditization. This differentiation is achieved not only through our product offerings, but how we design and package those products along with the services we offer. In this aspect, LSI is unique in the way we work with our agents and partners and how we use lighting, graphics, and our installation services to better serve our customers. I'm happy to say that our results in this quarter in the midst of a pretty challenging environment, go to underline the progress we're making on this strategy. Sales are up sequentially, quarter over quarter. Margins are up. Operating income is up, net income is up, and earnings per share are up versus prior year. This progress cautiously emboldens us as a team to continue a responsible investment in our strategy and acceleration of our plans. Over the last few quarters, I have talked about the investments we're making, including the release of new products the increasing use of intelligence and controls in our devices, and the investments of additional commercial resources, along with the expansion of our vertical market focus. Now, in some cases, our vertical market focus is simply a matter of refreshing or adjusting our position in certain markets to accommodate for overall change. In others, it's an expansion in our existing markets with new services or products, and yet in others, it's the introduction of entirely new markets. In several of our established markets, we enjoy strong preference and brand awareness based on decades of experience and an understanding of the market needs and opportunities. We work closely with our niche agents, our general agents, and distribution partners to understand not only the customer's articulated need or request, but also the opportunity to see and develop solutions to address the unmet needs. We're able to introduce forward-looking thinking and improvements on design and specifications of the projects which is, increases our value as a partner. We add value throughout the use of different graphics materials, sensors, controls, optics, light cutoff, and we improve the ease of installation and performance of our products in such areas as uniformity and durability, all resulting in less maintenance, longer operating life, and lower overall cost of ownership. These principles span across our solution sets, whether it's in lighting or graphics. The commercial effort we are investing in 
is oriented around qualifying our customers' goals, highlighting our strengths, and focusing on those projects where we can create competitive advantages. Last year in our automotive vertical, we designed a custom-built large indoor fixture in partnership with one of the world's largest Japanese automakers. The goal was to have a fixture that would properly highlight their product in showrooms across the country with the right color temperature, intensity, and uniformity. The project was not simply bid out, but instead it was an engineered solution that leveraged our unique capabilities, including design and manufacturing, along with a network of partners across the country to assure proper application and installation. In this case, LSI worked with the customer as a partner and not simply as a manufacturer or supplier. Last quarter, I mentioned a contactless payment project with one of the world's largest oil retailers. In this case, we helped design and deploy a payment option allowing customers to pay at a pump using a mobile application. LSI worked with the customer and a team of their partners to print a QR code and an embedded near field chip into a series of graphics. And then we managed the deployment and the installation in just over 11,500 locations. These locations included anywhere from two to 16 plus pumps at each site. The project was in the works for over a year, but the deployment was scheduled to be completed from start to finish in just over three and a half months. I'm happy to say that we're more than 70% through this deployment and things are moving along well. In fact, just this week, we were awarded another 1,100 locations in addition to the 11,500 locations on the initial project spec. Last month, we issued a press release announcing our partnership as the official lighting partner of the USA Pickleball. Pickleball is one of the largest growing sports in the United States and it's part of the sports courts industry, which includes tennis, paddle, basketball, and others. As the official lighting partner of the USA Pickleball Association, we'll have much improved visibility to one of the fastest growing sports in the US. This partnership goes to underline our strength in an offering in the sports court market. For decades, LSI has provided solutions to this market, and with a refreshed product offering in this space and more to come in the future, we see a real growth opportunity ahead of us. This week, we issued a press release announcing that we awarded a $20 million contract to provide indoor digital menu board systems to one of the world's largest fast food retailers. This is a follow-on order to the $100 million award announced last year and goes to further illustrate our ability to expand our share of wallet and our overall offering in a key vertical market we compete in. These projects all go to underline the strength of our strategy and the opportunities in front of us. Next week, we'll be hosting our agent and partner meeting as well as LSI's national sales meeting. These meetings will occur virtually, and as of today, we have over 500 agents and partners registered and planning to attend. We will be sharing a roadmap of our plans for the future years, including the induction, introduction of 25 plus new products in the upcoming quarters and the expansion of our existing vertical markets. We are all glad to have a calendar year 2020 behind us. Employee and partner safety remains at the top of our list as we start calendar 20 year 21. I'm proud of how the team at LSI has found a way to not just survive in the current environment, but also to thrive. With that, I will turn the call back over to Jim Galise for a closer look at our financials. Thank you, Jim. I'll start by highlighting key financial statistics for the fiscal second quarter. Sales were $76 million, increasing 9% sequentially from Q1 and below prior year as projected. Net income was $2.2 million, compared to income of $1.7 million last year. Non-GAAP, or adjusted net income, increased 47% to $2.5 million versus $1.7 million in the same period last year. Earnings per diluted share were $0.08 cents versus $0.07 cents in Q2 of fiscal 2020, and non-GAAP earnings per diluted share were $0.09 cents versus $0.07 cents per share last year. Adjusted EBITDA was $5.1 million, or 6.7% of sales, 130 basis points above prior year. The company generated $5.3 million of free cash flow in the quarter, increasing our cash balance to $13.6 million as we exit fiscal Q2. 
The company maintains an existing credit facility of $75 million and continues to have no long-term debt. We continue to effectively manage working capital in the face of constantly changing market conditions due to COVID, with non-cash working capital decreasing both sequentially and to prior year. This also reflects our capability of managing the new product introduction process, launching new products while concurrently phasing out existing lines, minimizing duplicate inventory and obsolescence exposure. New product activity was very active in Q2, with five new products introduced, and we will continue to accelerate throughout the second half of the fiscal year. This includes a key expansion of our outdoor portfolio and the next generation of several indoor product groups. A regular cash dividend of five cents per share was declared payable February 9th for shareholders of record on February 1st. Now I'll briefly comment on segment operating performance. As mentioned, sales increased 9% sequentially from Q1, with the graphics segment increasing 27%, while the lighting segment, more impacted by the resurgence of COVID, was flat to the prior quarter. The graphics increase was driven by the petroleum and grocery verticals, including the petroleum 11,000 site contactless payment project and project activity for several large grocery firms. Development work on potential new programs remains very active. In lighting, project quotation activity remains favorable, realizing quote and inquiry levels above prior year throughout the quarter, including improved activity in several of our key verticals, including automotive. But we also observed the quote to order conversion period lengthening, indicating the industry challenge in managing project planning and scheduling. The business gross margin rate improved 160 basis points versus prior year, with multiple factors contributing. Price mix is favorable, reflecting the ongoing focus on higher value applications and solutions. Productivity continues to be a major contributor as we align our manufacturing costs to market requirements. Design savings are a sizable part of productivity as we identify ways to engineer costs out of our product while improving features and ease of contractor use. Both segments generated improved gross margins compared to prior year, with graphics improving 280 basis points and lighting 140 basis points. The lighting gross margin rate again finished above 30%. Q2 operating expenses declined 7% versus prior year, reflecting our strong focus on priorities, which includes investment in key commercial initiatives, notably sales resources and targeted marketing programs, balanced with ongoing identification of cost savings and leverage. Looking forward to the second half of the fiscal year, we are encouraged with improving trends in market activity and the impact our commercial initiatives can generate. But we also recognize that market conditions may remain inconsistent in the near term. Therefore, we'll continue to balance our diligent focus on execution with investing in initiatives to generate growth. I'll now return the call back to the moderator. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we will be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, you may press star one on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star two if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star key. Our first question comes from the line of Craig Irwin with Roth Capital. Please proceed with your question. Good morning. This is uh, Andrew on for Craig. I just want to say congrats on the quarter. Um, great start to, to 2021. Um, my first question is about margins. Uh, you guys have exhibited strong margins this quarter uh, in both segments uh, with the strong year-over-year -year increase. Can you guys just comment on the sustainability of margins at these levels and then just the uh, dynamics um, in each segment? Yeah, Andrew, good morning. Thank you. Uh, tell uh, Craig we missed him. Um, 
you know, we're, we've been very focused on our margin improvement, uh, you know, quarter over quarter. We talk about it. We believe we still have room uh, to work within margins. Uh, there, you know, we are affecting it through a number of, of programs. It's not just, uh, you know, uh, cost out initiatives. It's, uh, you know, aligning ourselves with the right markets and the right mix. Uh, it's capitalizing on the strengths that we have. And it's uh, working with customers that, that respect the, you know, the products we're delivering, the solutions we're delivering, as opposed to getting into the, the bid environments and things like that. And so I think it's a, it's a culmination of all of those efforts, and I think that we still have room to run there. Uh, you know, we may not, uh, you know, see quite the ramp up of improvement from where we are, uh, you know, right now going forward that we have seen in the past, but we still think we can uh, continue to turn that wheel. Great. Thank you. That was very helpful. And uh, one quick follow-up. Um, can you just provide some insights into what you're seeing in the March quarter, uh, specifically with the um, seasonality? And then um, just also any commentary on uh, quote rate levels. Uh, I know you guys uh, said they were increasing the past few quarters. I was just curious if this has continued. Or past few months, I apologize. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, quote activity has definitely picked up. Um, we have also noticed a, a kind of a lengthening between quote to conversion, meaning, uh, you know, uh, the, the, I think that there's pent up demand and there's some release relative to projects, and uh, you know, people are getting the quotes and, and refreshing quotes. Uh, and and we, you know, we're we're waiting for those to convert to orders, uh, but uh, we did. We've definitely seen a little expansion in that quote to conversion time. But the good news also is we're seeing a very good uptake in the customers that do end up quoting with us, the number that actually convert to orders. So uh, that's been very positive. Uh, generally, as you saw, uh, you know, as you saw in the release this morning, um, you know, Q1 over Q2 over Q1, we've had sequential improvement. Uh, we expect that to remain in Q3. So we're looking for improvement uh, in Q3 over Q2. Uh, how March ends up breaking out, I can't tell you right now, but uh, based on our quote activity and based on the projects we see on the chalkboard, so to speak, we're very encouraged about a robust March. We did not, um, you know, because of our uh, quote to order to shipment cycle, we didn't see a lot of impact from COVID in March of last year, minus our distribution business. Uh, Atlas did feel it a little bit quicker. Uh, but we believe that even though we didn't feel a lot of impact, uh, we should do very well on a year-over-year -year comparative uh, uh, coming into the coming into Q3 and into March. Great. Well, thank you for uh, taking my questions, and once again, uh, congratulations on the strong results. Thank you, Andrew. As a reminder, it is star one to ask a question. Our next question comes from the line of Samir Josie with H.C. Wainwright. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for taking my questions and congratulations on a nice quarter. Uh, uh, my first question is, uh, uh, we understand uh, COVID could uh, be a headwind uh, for the next few quarters. So uh, is the cadence of the revenues still on upward trajectory for the next two quarters? Uh, especially given your uh, seasonal performance last year? Well, we always have some seasonality, and I think that it uh, we're, we're seeing some uh, activity that it may be out of season, so to speak, where things are, uh, you know, orders or projects that had been delayed. Uh, they're coming, uh, you know, they're coming in the third quarter where typically they would have come in in the second quarter or maybe deferred to the fourth quarter. Uh, so, you know, that, that's very encouraging for us, the way we're looking at the third quarter. And then the fourth quarter, if we get back into the seasonality, plus mixing it with the pent-up demand, we could see a very strong fourth quarter. And there's certainly some early indicators, particularly around the quote activity, that that's very possible that could happen. And, and is this uh, from uh, the, uh, like, what segment is this from? The lighting segment uh, where you expect... Uh, these times to shrink, or uh, is it uh, from petroleum, graphics, that kind of thing? It's chiefly from the lighting side of things. Uh, petroleum definitely does, you know, the graphics side, particularly in the petroleum side, does have a reset in the month of 
January and February typically, and that's all planned in, you know, that's all baked into our plans. Uh, but we, we think that, uh, you know, as we talk about that quote to order cycle, um, we believe there's two things that are going to affect that. Uh, they're both oriented around lighting. Uh, and, and so we're, you know, we're hoping to see a better third quarter than we would see from a seasonality standpoint. And then the second is uh, on our graphics uh, from digital, uh, Burger King specifically, uh, they've really ramped up the speed to meet with, um, uh, you know, some um, uh, project timing that they want to make sure that they get in. Uh, so on the digital side, we, we definitely see uh, some opportunity there in the third quarter. So uh, just stepping back on, 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 a, on a larger a macro scale or level, uh, do you expect uh, uh, benefits coming over the next six to 12 months from uh, uh, higher infrastructure spending, capital expenditures by companies? Well, we've definitely been paying attention to, you know, a lot of the orientation, you know, a lot of the discussion, particularly from the incoming administration about investments in infrastructure. You know, from a lighting standpoint, we play very solidly in that and could be a benefactor of that. Uh, I think that some of that is uh, we're starting to see some of that in terms of, uh, you know, the quotes that are coming in and the project activity that is being looked at. But it's still a little early to tell how that's going to um you know, all shake out right now. I think, you know, on whole, it's important to, you know, just just remember that we do have stops and starts that we're still dealing with. Uh, we have supply chain, um, you know, challenges where, you know, COVID's affecting them or things like that. So uh, we remain very bullish, but there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of pieces to this whole puzzle. Understood. Uh, you, you have spoken about uh, uh, 10 percent uh, increase in uh, sales force. Uh, uh, do you have a sense of timeline? Is it uh, beginning or is it already done? Uh, can you give us some color on that? And, and I'm sorry, you cut out just slightly in the beginning part, and I missed. Jim, did you get that? Yeah. Oh, the sales force, uh, yeah. Oh, a sales force increase. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and the question was, have we started that yet? Where we're at. Oh, where we're yeah. at. What, what, it's, yes, it yeah. completely cut out on my side. Um, yeah, so we have, uh, you know, we talked about it over the last few quarters. We are certainly making investment in our commercial activities. That is, you know, from a marketing standpoint, you saw, you know, our announcement about our partnership with Pickleball, and it goes right along in lines when we were talking about our vertical market development from a true commercial standpoint, you know, talking sales resources on the street, you know, right now we're targeting a 10%, you know, improvement, and we're probably 80% through that in terms of actually getting folks on board. Um, you know, there is some ramp up time uh, to that. You know, you bring on a new resource, we've got to, you know, get them trained up and, and get them specific to, uh, you know, a knowledge specific to our company. Uh, we've also added some resources that are, may not uh, qualify directly under the commercial side, but on our services business, uh, you know, which we referenced quite a bit with this uh, rollout of the contactless payment, uh, also with other, you know, the, the digital menu board systems that we're rolling out. Uh, our services side of the business has, has experienced a, a pretty good growth, and we are investing some resources there too. And there again, uh, we're, we're kind of you know, 80%, 90% of our planned investment. But we're continuing to, you know, we, we watch this real-time live, and as, as long as the opportunities are there, we'll continue to make those investments and expand those resources. We don't have any constraint or cap uh, relative to what we're willing to invest in if we can show the return. Understood. Uh, and just one clarification on the cost side. Uh, when you uh, mentioned that uh, you're continuing to uh, cost out uh, of, uh, of uh, take cost, engineer costs out, uh, are you also doing any uh, cost controls at the operating level? Uh, uh, that should mean that, of course, you're spending on sales, but uh, are there any other efficiencies that you are able to derive? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, number one, from a cost control standpoint, I think we have, a, you know, a, a very good team of people here that, that recognize, you know, uh, what investment in return looks like. We, you know, we don't have systems that are inflexible. 
uh, you know, we're always looking for opportunities and we'll, you know, always kind of invest ahead of the curve uh, if it, you know, puts anything at risk or or it, uh, or it creates an opportunity or anything like that. Um, we do believe that there are still some opportunities, and this comes back to the margin thing, uh, but we do believe we still have a we have turns on the wheel here that we can continue to implement. It's just a matter of doing it that doesn't disrupt any commitments that we have to our customers or things like that. Um, but the answer is yes, we do believe we still have some opportunity. Got it. Uh, thanks for the color and thanks for taking my question. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Jed Gersheimer with Canaccord Genuity. Please proceed with your question. Hey, thanks. Uh, I joined a little bit late, so I uh, apologize in advance if you've already addressed this. But I was wondering if you think through some of the changes, you know, sort of large scale. So you're seeing, you know, uh, um, further pressure on on sort of that petroleum um, market segment, which you're strong in. Uh, and and some of the auto in terms of uh, or maybe you're, maybe you're not you know are you I, so I guess first question are you seeing pressure kind of equally spread across end markets for lighting between um, uh, quick stop and service station and automotive? Well, from the you know uh, so on in terms of the petroleum retailers, uh, we've seen a continued investment from those folks. Um, you know, uh, they are not easily disrupted. Their plans are usually well thought out. They're put out, uh, you know, ahead of them in terms of years. Uh, and, you know, they, we didn't have much of a disruption in terms of their commitment uh, during this whole COVID side of things. Frankly, the challenges were just, uh, you know, uh, electrical permits, uh, construction permits, inspections, things like that uh, from a timing perspective. Um and we anticipate it to continue to be relatively strong. I think that, uh, you know, some of the oil retailers have been talking about, uh, you know, their activities and the things that they've been doing to control their costs and investment cycles and things like that, and they remain fairly committed. On the automotive, um, you know, we – I'll just make a point to say on the, you know, on the last day of the year, we had a very large commitment, uh, you know, from a customer – uh, and then on the first day of our calendar, you know, of the calendar year, we had another. So, uh, you know, we look at it from the outside like like many would probably say, you know, the buying cycles have changed. Uh, people are buying more online. There's less going on in the showroom. Uh, but we're also seeing some of our, you know, some of the larger automotive customers taking advantage of the downtime in the showrooms and in the lots and making investments right now, maybe preparatory type of things being ready, uh, you know, when, when uh, you know, COVID kind of gets under control, if you will. So, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing pretty steady activity. It would be the answer, Jed. Uh, Jed yeah, David, I mean, yep, uh, go ahead. I was just going to add to that, you know, back to the, you know, to the Petro side. As you know, those are generally, you know, very large, you know, multi-year, you know, programs. And so they, you know, go through various phases of the cycle. But it's important to note we watch the potential uh, development work on few potential future programs very closely. And that uh, development work pipeline right now remains very strong. You know, so these are the programs then that would start, you know, affecting us uh, maybe in later calendar year this year and then on through the next couple of years. So we have both the current programs, but we monitor our act activity on uh, future development programs very, very closely. Gotcha. So, um, you know, it's a little counterintuitive, but it seems like, you know, headline, there's, there's a lot of headline risk, but the actual activity in the market is, uh, um, seems much stronger. On the auto side, you know, COVID is, the feedback we're getting is, is COVID's actually a positive for auto sales because, Nobody's taking public transportation anymore, and uh, most retailers have seen a seen an increase. So that kind of makes sense. Um, one last question for you, just on the uh, uh, on the lighting, um, uh, and maybe for um, commercial. Um, have, have you seen a change over the past uh, uh, couple of years in terms of the influence of 
um, spectral tuning or the ability to to tune on prem um, with uh, with the light, or is it still uh, mostly static? Uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of conversation about it. You know, the whole concept of selectable color temperatures and things like that is definitely taken hold. Uh, you know, it allows uh, our, our customers, our installers and such to, it allows us to reduce inventory and, and you know, uh, skew diversity, you know, proliferation. Same with lumen output. Uh, yeah, same with lumen output. Um, but spectral is, is kind of, it's complicated because it starts with the LEDs and it is impacted by the lensing that you're putting on it. And that may be, uh, you know, that may not be something that uh, we kind of get any time soon. Uh, but it is certainly something that's talked about. But I, I don't expect to see it rolling out into the field anytime soon. It's just the the cost for that flexibility is too high right now. Got it. Got it. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Jed, thank you. There are no further questions in the queue. I'd like to hand the call back to Mr. Clark for closing remarks. I just want to say thank you again for everybody that tuned in. Uh, you know, we're happy with the quarter, the way it has uh, developed. Uh, we're, I think we're coming into the new calendar year with a, with a certain degree of momentum, and, uh, you know, we're looking forward to trying to keep up that momentum and uh, capitalize on it. Uh, I, uh, I just want to say thank you again for calling in, and we'll look forward to talking to you soon. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, this does include today's teleconference. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time and have a wonderful day.